I'd now like to introduce our speaker. <laughs> um, author and journalist Michael Wiggy began his career as an anchor for the German Viva program, London Calling, in 2002. Since then, the world has been his newsroom and playground, whether he is living with the native Yanomami Indian tribe in the Amazon rainforest, taking the longest recorded donkey ride in the history of music television, or fighting sumo wrestlers in Japan. One of his more recent adventures involved traveling throughout 14 different countries with the goal of turning a half-eaten apple into a dream home in Hawaii, using only the bartering system. Since then, he's become an award-winning travel show host, how to travel the world for free, how to barter for paradise, and how to travel 2,000 miles on a kick scooter in 80 days are just three of his seven travel shows. He has shared his amazing success stories on both The Tonight Show and The Today Show. His TV programs and books have been broadcast and published internationally. Please join me in welcoming Michael Wiggy. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Thank you very much for the invitation. I'm very excited to speak here. And first of all, I want to thank the ladies here in the front, at the front table. You know why? Well, you made it in the first row. I mean, this is a scary place. Look at it. You know, but you, you were brave enough to sit in the first row. So hey, thank you very much. Yeah? So today, I would like to talk about one of my adventures, yeah? how to travel the world for free. That was an adventure I, I faced a couple years ago, traveling from Berlin, Germany, Berlin, where I'm from, German, I'm German, F accent is real, didn't make it up. So traveling from Berlin, Germany to Antarctica without any money, no money for food, no money for traveling, no money for accommodation, kind of a challenge. And afterwards, I looked back on the trip, and I was like, OK, what, what did I learn from it? And the main thing that came, came up was like I got so much better in embracing change, something we all go through. Our society, our, 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 our work life is constantly changing, probably more than ever before. And this trip taught me seven lessons about change that I learned along the way on this trip without money because you know, I had to get food, accommodation, and travel for free. And it was different in every country, in every city, with all these people. Like, the ideas I developed how to do this worked in one place, but they didn't work in the next place. So I was, it was necessary to change. And this is what I would like to share with you. And I'm sure the lessons I learned about change are pretty applica applicable to your work situation as well. So how to travel the world for free I did it, and you can do it too. So maybe afterwards, everyone is kind of taking off for travel without money. We will see. So <laughs> let's just start. Traveling without money. I was carrying the sign so everyone could see, well, this guy really doesn't have any money on him. Huh? So let's just kind of help him, hopefully. So the trip was planned like this. A 30 to 35,000 kilometer journey from Berlin to Antarctica will be anything but a walk in the park without a penny in his pocket. The journey will take him across the Atlantic to Canada and on to the USA, hopefully taking in the Grand Canyon, through Central America and eventually through Colombia and finally down along South America. After traveling through at least 10 countries and practically all climates the planet has to offer, he will somehow find a way across the Drake Passage to Antarctica. So I started in Berlin, Germany, capital of, of Germany, and I was confronted with the first lesson on change management right away. Challenge your fears. Because when I stood there and I said goodbye to my friends, you know, see you in half a year, I felt fear because I knew I have to embrace change on a daily basis. This is going to be a challenge, and I felt the fear. And this is so important when we are trying to reach a goal, when we are trying to embrace change, that we confront us with certain obstacles and emotions. And we are all humans, and we usually tend to go around it. Fair enough. We want to be in our comfort zone. That's pretty, pretty human, pretty natural. But when we change that pattern, 
and get up in the morning and, and tell ourselves, hey, today I want to do it, do it upside down. If any kind of fear, any kind of uncomfortable emotion is coming up, I'm just going to go for it on purpose instead of going around. And that is such a good strategy to overcome certain obstacles and to become a better, like, like a stronger person in terms of change management. And there is a great quote from the author Richie Norton, to escape fear, you have to go around it. You have to not go around it, you have to go through it and not around. And this is something the trip taught me so much. Yeah? At the beginning of the trip, I kind of wanted to go around, but no, it doesn't work. You just go for it, you experience this uncomfortable emotion, and it disappears. When, whenever we, we decide, hey, whatever fear comes up, I just go for it, it dissolves quicker than we ever expect. And this is what I experienced on this trip, and I'm happy to have done it. So this was a very first important lesson. So how do I start traveling for free? Hitchhiking. Very common thing to do. I crossed Germany by hitchhiking and made it to Belgium, neighboring country, Belgium. So traveling, the start was pretty all right, but how do you get food if you don't have money? So there was zero, zero money, zero euro, zero dollar on me, nothing. So I tried the border system. This was a bakery in Belgium, and I just went in there, saw the muffin. I was like, wow, I want to have that muffin. And I asked the lady in the bakery, what do I have to do? What do I have to border to get the muffin for free? And the lady said right away, if you tell me a joke, and the joke is good, you're going to get the muffin for free. <laughs> right. So I told the joke. The joke was kind of all right. And she was like, well, hey, you, you've done what I was asking you. We have a deal. Here's the muffin for free. And this is how I've done it in 11 countries, 25,000 miles around the world. I always went into shops, restaurants, and cafes, or I approached people, people or uh, uh, individual people on the street, and I asked them, what do I have to barter to get like a sandwich for free, to get this for free? And everyone has a wish. One person says, look, if you're going to do a handstand here and you're going to make it, you're going to get the coffee and, and the food for free. Other restaurant owners might say, hey, if you're going to get two customers in who have dinner, paid dinner, you're going to get your dinner for free. So this was like a, like a huge game of barter deals to get food for free. And it worked in 11 countries around the world. And this is already the second lesson I, I was confronted with. You know, like when, when, when doing some, some kind of self-experiment like this trip for free, you get confronted with your beliefs, with, with your sometimes subconscious beliefs. And we all have certain beliefs that push us, huh? great beliefs, positive beliefs that make, make us, you know, have a great life, but sometimes we do have a couple of beliefs that kind of hold us back. And it's worth it to just kind of research and look at our beliefs. And these beliefs sometimes are kind of subconscious, so we, we wouldn't know right away. So for example here, you know, like I mentioned, I grew up in Germany, and in Germany we are a little bit less extroverted than here in the United States. When I grew up as a child, I, I learned this belief, you know, never stand out too much. It's not appropriate uh, so much in, in, in Germany. So when, when you learn that belief, it's kind of difficult to approach 50, 60, 70 people a day to ask for some barter deal and to tell your story. Because, you know, you, well, because I learned something different. You know, Be part of the crowd. Don't stand out too much. So I worked on that belief before I left the trip. And I changed it. I changed it to, hey, if I have a good reason, it's absolutely fine to stand out and to approach all these people. And I practiced that belief. I practiced it. I wrote it down. I wrote it down. It's absolutely fine to approach all these people. And it worked out. It got so much easier during the trip to do this. So nowadays, I, I work in coaching, huh? speaking coaching. And the majority of my clients, when we're talking about change, Huh? Associate change with loss and not with gain. And this is pretty interesting because there is often fear involved. Oh, something is changing. We might lose something. Well, so that's a belief sentence. And it's worth 
to, to change it to a positive belief sentence. You know, in most cases, when we go through a process of change, it's, it'll be rewarding. We, we gain something. Otherwise, our world wouldn't be the world we are living in because it was a constant process of change and we're developing, developing, developing. And so this is a good belief sentence to work on the ability to, uh, to uh, embrace change. So back to the trip from Europe to North America to Canada. I worked on a container ship and it was pretty good. So I, I didn't get any paycheck. I just you know, worked to travel across the Atlantic. And I had to do all these things people do when they work on, on, a, on a cargo ship, like exchanging oil on a 23,000 horsepower engine. And my first reaction was fear. I can't do that. You know, I'm not even able to, to change oil in my car. How should I do it with a 23,000 horsepower engine in a container ship? So it was like, oh, no, 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 I don't want to do it. But then I thought about the belief sentence. Well, sure, let me try this. You know, like the belief sentence is holding me back. It's, it's not my ability. It's just that sentence in my mind that tells me somehow you can't do it. Why, why can't I not do it? So I just asked that gentleman, could you please show me how to do the, the oil change in, uh, on this engine? And we went, we went through it step by step, and I made it. And I made it. So confronting my fear, detecting this negative belief sentence, and just going for it and making it. And this is like so typical for every kind of new situation we're dealing with and we, we're fearful of. So 12 days later, I, I made it to Montreal in Canada. So here, you see me sitting down there using the little computer. And that was so important to make it around the world without money. Because with a computer, you can lock into free Wi-Fi networks all over the world nowadays. And then you go on social media, different kind of social media. And then you just reach out to people and say, hey, I'm traveling without money. I'm currently in Montreal. Do you know anyone who lives there who could host me for free for a couple of days? And it works. You know, if you have a strong social media, I got like a couple thousand on Facebook, a couple thousand on LinkedIn, a couple thousand on, on Twitter. So people, people read that and they're like, yeah, I got a friend in Montreal. Let me just call him. Yeah, you, you, can, you can sleep over at his house for like a couple of nights. This is how I got accommodation in most of the places. And if you imagine, this was like, like, like a couple years ago. So internet was, 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 was working, everything. Just imagine 20 years ago, before the age, before we, we all were using internet, or 25 years ago, I wouldn't have been able to do this trip. And I remember in 1995, I was like 18 years old, first time using the internet. I was still in Germany, and I wanted to go to the United States to, to have a voluntary year in Santa Barbara. And it was the first time I was using the internet in Germany. And I, I, there was no Google yet. It was like Yahoo or Scape or something. And I, put, I just wrote Santa Barbara and I pressed enter. And it was like this image coming up within five minutes, like with a palm tree. And I was like, that must be Santa Barbara. I want to go. So just imagine how things have developed, how fast nowadays we use, we're using we're using this technology, and that means we're going through this constant process of change, which sometimes can be a little bit painful, something new again, something new again, something new again. But imagine we would still be in, in the 90s with that image building up five minutes with a palm tree in Santa Barbara. I wouldn't have made it around the world without money. So I'm absolutely glad about all these developments in the last 20 years, which bring us forward so much. So from Montreal, I entered the United States. And my plan was to hitchhike 2,500 miles from Cleveland to Los Angeles. Well, and then I started, and the cars didn't, didn't really stop. No car stopped. So I just asked some people along the way, so what's going on? Do I look funny, or is anything wrong? And they were like, no, no but, but it's not really legal nowadays. You know? It's kind of rare that people take a hitchhiker. It's not in most states in the United States. It's, it's just not legal. So I had to use plan B, and plan B was hiking. Well, so I started hiking part of Ohio, and it was beautiful. I had the tent. 
You know, I had the cameras on me, I was filming the whole trip, and I was just hiking, walking, meeting people, talking to people, people inviting me to their homes, and it was an awesome experience. First, when, when I realized hitchhiking doesn't work, it felt like a failure. It felt like, oh, I'm in a crisis, things don't work out. But then plan B made it so much better. Well, I met all these people and finally, I even, like, an, like some person stopped by in his horse buggy. And you can imagine, like a person in a horse buggy, it must be an Amish farmer, right? So I was like, why, why do you go in a horse buggy? And he was like, yeah, well, you know, us farm, Amish farmers, we live the kind of like old-fashioned lifestyle, you know, without technology. And he explained to me uh, how the Amish farmers live, and they don't use the internet, they don't do all these things. And he's like, yeah, and we live in a very beautiful town. And I was like, Berlin? Did I go in a circle? Am I back home? It kind of looked like home, but I was like, is, is that where I started? It was not, because it's just a town of 100 people all Amish farmers, no cars, no internet. It was so basic. And I was really intrigued by it and I asked them, can I stay over and just like learn about you guys? And they gave me permission, I could stay there and experience this lifestyle of the Amish farmers. Great experience and I would have never met them if I wouldn't have failed in the first time with the hitchhiking. I'm glad the hitchhiking dis didn't work, didn't work out, because otherwise I would have never met the Amish farmers. I would have taken a car across the United States and wouldn't have seen anything. So it can be so rewarding sometimes to not make it, to fail, because we have to find plan B, plan C, plan D, and that often brings us further than even plan A would have. So at the end of my, my stay, three-day stay uh, with the Amish farmers, I got a present from, 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 from Mark and his family, a mountain bike. That was pretty awesome, like a mountain bike. I thought, okay, I'm gonna go uh, travel across Ohio with that mountain bike. But there was a little thing going on. The, the mountain bike only had one gear. The, the other gears were broken, only the 18th gear, which meant like, you know, like when you go up here, it doesn't really work. So <laughs> a day later, you see me, I was completely done. Huh? Completely done, I couldn't move on. So second crisis. First crisis, hitchhiking doesn't work. Second crisis, mountain bike doesn't work. So first I got a little bit frustrated. Ah, oh, it doesn't work, why I'm on this trip? Why, did, why have I ever done this? I shouldn't have, and then I stopped. I was like, listen, what can I learn from, from, from this situation? It's normal that things don't work out. You know, always when we are in projects or when we are in a change project, pro, uh, process, there are, there are phases when things work out and phases when things don't work out. And these situations when things don't work out are the most valuable ones to learn from. And so I thought about it, what is plan B? Well, sure, sell the bike in Columbus, Ohio, sell the bike and buy a bus ticket with a Greyhound bus across the Midwest. Easy, much easier than the bike. So failure as an opportunity in, uh, for change. Yeah. And I'm sure you all know this. When, when you're in a process in your association at work and, and, and things are changing, you have ups and downs. And it's so absolutely fine to, to be open to all the down phases and just embrace them as a learning situation. And this is what I learned on this trip. There are the good times and the bad times. The bad times are even more valuable sometimes than the good times. So I have a great example of failure. You, you all know, most likely, Elon Musk, yeah? one of the greatest entrepreneurs of our times. I mean, I think he's very impressive with his companies, PayPal, Tesla, SpaceX. I think it's so impressive. And I, I read about him a lot. And when, when, when you read his biography, it's kind of all about failure. And I'm like, okay, what's going on? I mean, it's such a successful man. Why, why do I read so much failure? So he writes about Fa PayPal fired him. He was bankrupt almost a few times. The rocket exploded in SpaceX and so on. And, and I thought about it. You know, it's, it's a person who is so extremely successful. 
he, he, is, he can be open about failures. He doesn't have an issue with it. He's like, hey, and, and these companies didn't work out. I started another company. Well, that's how it goes. And I find it so helpful sometimes when things don't work out to think about this and, be, and, and, and see him as like a role model in, in a certain situation. Well, things do not always work out. On this world trip without money and in business as well and embrace these situations when things I'm not that good. So I had the bus ticket across the Midwest, easy ride to Albuquerque, New Mexico. In Albuquerque, I saw the sign Route 66. And Route 66 is like world famous. When I grew up in Germany and, and we saw movies about the United States, it was always the Route 66, big adventures. and. I just wanted to go along the Route 66, and I started hitchhiking here. It was possible, a bit in remote areas, and that car, great Mustang from the 1960s, took me to Vegas. So I thought, this is, the, this is great now, a lot of fun. Let's go to Vegas. But, but without money, it can be a little bit of a challenge. Because there is you know, a lot of entertainment, but if you don't have money, kind of tricky, the whole situation. So everything I've done so far didn't work out. I tried to barter food, uh, didn't go that easy. I tried to get some accommodation for free over the internet, social media. People were like, look, we got so much tourism going on here. It doesn't really work. So nothing worked. So I was forced to embrace change again. And I felt like, well, again? You know, I've done, I've, I've done the, the whole embracing change process so many times, but again? Well, I had to. Otherwise, that would have been the end of the trip. So I thought about new ideas. How can I kind of generate either money for travel or food or accommodation? And first idea failed, second one, and I thought, okay, failing is good, you learned that already. You know, just fail, fail, plan C, plan D, it's gonna be better. And then there was plan E, and it was good. It was, it's entitled the human so far. So what's the human so far? So I'm on the boulevard in Vegas, and you, you know, you just see 100 degrees, people kind of tired, it's hot, and, and you don't find any benches, benches in Vegas. So if you're gonna be on vacation there, just look for some benches to hang out. You don't find many, many benches. So I developed the human so far, for one dollar. People could hang out on the human sofa for a dollar, <laughs> rest, take a photo for home, you know, and just say, hey, what have you done in Vegas? Well, I hung out on the German sofa. It was a German human sofa for some reason, but well, why not? It was a human sofa. Some people chipped in five dollars, you know, that was good. So the whole idea worked out. It was a great success. People liked it, and, and I had enough money to take a bus to California. So, the, so at this stage, I thought, well, you found that great idea, human sofa for the rest of your trip. This is gonna be, you, you, this is gonna be so good. You just travel one, one hour in the morning, human sofa, wherever you are, and you have enough money for travel, accommodation, and food. Well, it didn't work. The human sofa only works in Las Vegas. It doesn't, it doesn't work anywhere else for some reason. So I was forced to, to develop new ideas. And I was like, OK, change, change. You have to change again. You know? And it's so interesting. When we talk about change in a corporate process, sometimes there are like little, little let's say, mistakes made. Why ch like a larger change process doesn't work. And one of these reasons is the belief that a change process should only be temporary. Like my belief was, okay, I'm done with changing, Las Vegas, human so far, I do it everywhere. But that's not how it is. When you're in a change process, it's, it's an ongoing process. And here are a couple of reasons why sometimes a process of change management may fail. Like the goal is not clear enough, old structures get in the way, or staff or the leaders think it should be only a two month period and then we are done with the change process. It's not, it's an ongoing thing. And this is so important to embrace, hey, we're, we're changing, we are in a change process, this is gonna be long term. And then it's gonna be very successful. So I was in San Francisco, made it to San Francisco, realized the human so far doesn't work. 
Huh? People don't need the human sofa in San Francisco. So I tried new ideas. Huh? The breast brace changed. First idea didn't work out. But then the next idea. Steep hills, as you can see. So I developed the hill helper. The hill helper pushes people up the hill because the hills in San Francisco are so steep. For a dollar, does it work? And I got the first client. And he was like, OK, fair enough. Yeah, push me up the hill. I chip, I chip in a dollar. And I thought, OK, great. I found, I found it. I found it. This is going to be the idea for the rest of the trip. But it wasn't because he, he stayed my only customer. There was no other customer <laughs> coming up. So I was like, OK, good. All right. OK. It's never going to end. You have to accept that constant change is part of this trip. So new idea. So I looked around in San Francisco, and I was looking for like a niche. Like, what do people really need? What kind of service? And I saw people leaving the office at like 6 PM. And you know, some people are a little bit stressed out. And they could need probably like a kind of a relaxation thing. So I had the idea of pillow fighting. I had two pillows on me. And I offered pillow fighting for a dollar. And people could kind of really you know, get all the pressure out and just relieve it. Does it work in San Francisco? Here's the first customer. Well, chipped in a dollar. And it worked out. 10 minutes later, 100 people lining up to do pillow fighting in San Francisco. And as you can see here, I'm not even joining that pillow fight anymore. It's like the boss and his employee, they chipped in $5, and they just sort out whatever they have to sort out. <laughs> you know? So this was, the, this was the great idea for San Francisco. And I've done it for over a week, and here's the result. So $300 by pillow fighting, uh, enough money to get a plane ticket to Costa Rica, to Central America, like huge step into Central America. And I was, you know, half, this was half of my, my, my trip now. And I was pretty excited about the whole thing. You know, I made it like, like 12,000 miles already. This is going to work out. Yeah? And I had that same belief again. Oh, the pillow fighting is going to, going to work out in South America now. I can do it to Antarctica. This is going to work out. Just that one single idea, pillow fighting every morning, I'm done. Obviously, no. Yeah, I tried pillow fighting in Peru. People were like, excuse me? So different, <laughs> different places, different humor, and people were not going along with the pillow fighting in other countries. So uh, here in the US, very pillow fighting friendly, I must say. So yeah, very, very pillow fighting friendly. Ca Canada as well. I've, I've tried it in Montreal, worked out too. So, well, from, from here on, it, it was not stopping. Change, change, change. Every location, every country, new ideas. And now I kind of accepted, embraced it. It, it, it became the norm. I got, up in, I got up in the morning, and I was kind of like, OK, what's the new thing today? So instead of having this obstacle like, I don't want to embrace change, it, it became the norm. Yes, let's try something new. I'm ready for it. I want something new. And this was so interesting to experience, to have the mindset changed and to want to develop new ideas. So at this stage, I thought about understanding change. When we are experiencing change. What happens with us emotionally? At the beginning of the session, I talked about fear. Sometimes, if there is a lot of change, it can cause some fear. We don't know what's going to happen with the company, with the association. Too much change can be a little bit scary. But there is much more. If we look at a change process, we find seven emotional stages. Let's say something typical, there is that new online tool. Yeah? introduced at your workplace. No, that happened to me late, uh, lately, like a new coaching tool. I had to learn it. And the first emotional reaction like, was shock. Ooh, I, oh, the new, the new tool. I don't know how to do it. Kind of shock. Second one was disbelief. I don't know if this is going to make it better than the other tool. Why should it? The other, the other tool was good enough. Third, self-doubt. Will I ever be able to learn it? Then acceptance, well, kind of OK, the tool, why not? 
experimentation. Nah, let's just play around with it. Actually, it's pretty cool. And then it goes to integration at the end. And then it's like, well, I always said this new tool is the greatest thing ever. Huh? So that's me, kind of. Huh? So it's so interesting to look at these seven stages. And if you're leading teams, if, if, you're, if, you're, if you're dealing with other people at work, to, to forward this and say, hey, it's absolutely fine when things are changing. First, there is a negative reaction sometimes. Because it's kind of new, we have to learn, we have to leave the comfort zone, there might be fear. So and then these seven stages to integration, that the, the a very general process, and, and the more I understood this, the easier change became for me on this trip and even later on at my work. So it's like a curve. It's not a straight line. It's like a curve. Shock, disbelief, self-doubt, acceptance, and so on to integration. Huh? This is change. It's, it's not like this. So back to the trip. I was in Costa Rica, beautiful country in Central America, as you can see, and I could hitchhike. Hitchhiking was pretty easy. Like, yeah, people can just jump on the back of a truck. Well, sometimes a door is kind of missing, but it doesn't matter. People are pretty easy, jump on my truck. I'm gonna give you a ride. Small country, so I made it to Panama within a day. And in Panama, it was pretty interesting because uh, I wanted to go from Panama to Colombia, neighboring countries, and there is a problem, the, the border, has been shut for years, even decades. There is no chance to, to kind of drive or go from Panama to Colombia. The only chance you have is to, is to purchase an airplane ticket to fly over it, and that costs money I didn't have. So what should I do? I, I needed new ideas to make this happen. So I was brainstorming, what can I do without money? Uh -huh. And then I thought, well, okay, I'm, you know, citizenship is German, and, um, well, why not going to the German embassy in Panama City and just talking to them? You know, maybe the embassy has a good idea and they just want to help you. Do they do that? I don't know. So I just went there and they gave me an appointment with a German ambassador. So I talked to the German ambassador about barter deals. Like, what could I trade that you're going to help me over the border uh, with a plane ticket? And he was like, so what have you done so far? I was like, well, I've done some pillow fighting. German ambassador was like, well, n not here, we don't need that, you know, and I was talking about, you know, hill helper, no hills in Panama City, about the human sofa, he was like, nah, got, got, got one, got a sofa here, sorry. But then I, I just offered him something new. You know, I had a few items in my, in my backpack, and one was a costume as a butler, a British butler, because I thought maybe at one stage I'm gonna meet a person with a high status, and he likes to have a butler for a day. And there, there, he, there he was, on the left the butler, as you can see, and on the right is the German ambassador in Panama, and, and he hired me to be his butler for his garden party. So that was pretty good, he was pretty satisfied, he said, okay, good, you've been a great butler, butler. Um, I could buy a ticket to the neighboring country of Colombia. But there is an other gentleman in town. He is an agent to organize operas, op op operas huh? all around the world. And right now he's, he's organizing that opera um, uh, entitled the Magic, the Magic Flute from Mozart. Do you want to be his uh, helper, his kind of butler as well? And when, then we're going to chip in for a ticket to Peru for you. I was like, okay, let me meet that other gentleman. So here at the garden party, I, I met him, and that's the gentleman. Ah, serious business, you know, the whole opera business. And he was just organizing this premiere of the magic flute. And he was like, okay, you can bring in your boxes, do this, do that, do that. And then on, on the second day, he just asked me to be an extra on stage. He said, look, the, the, the sound is awesome, the whole Mozart magic flute thing, but we don't have enough people on stage. Would you do it? And I, w I thought, okay, change, change. You have to change. You have to embrace change. Well, however ridiculous this may look, you're going to be on stage. Do it. And so I was part of this like premiere in Panama, pretending to sing opera. I didn't, you know? And, well, embracing change, right? Done it. Left my comfort zone. And it was worth it because both of these gentlemen purchased a ticket for me to Peru, South America. So another huge jump to South America. So now I was in the last third of my trip. I knew I'm going to make it to Antarctica for free if I don't give up at this stage. 
So Peru, in the Andes, really beautiful country. Anyone already been there maybe one day, like kind of a backpacking trip or something? All right, okay. So a very famous site in Peru, or the most famous site, is the Inca site of Machu Picchu. Huh? Probably heard about this like famous Inca site, and everyone who travels to Peru wants to see it and, and wants to visit this Inca site, you know, once they're there. I want it the same, but going there, hiking there, is like a 50-mile hike across the Andes on 10,000 feet elevation, and you kind of have to book a tour to be safe, and that costs money. I didn't have money. So I thought, okay, I'm in this change process. I can do something else. I could be a porter for all these tourists and carry the luggage 50 miles across the Andes. You know, that uh, tour guide on the left warned me. He said, look, don't do it. You're not trained. This is like elevation kind of heavy carrying and so on. Don't do it. I said, yes, I can do it. So he's like, okay, do it. I hope you're going to make it. So I worked as this porter. You know, and I thought I can do anything at this stage because I was so practiced in like, all this change. So the start was still good. Yeah? We were hiking five days. I was carrying some luggage of the others. But first night, it was like eight, 9,000 elevation. We, the people who worked, didn't have a tent. So imagine you sleep at 8,000, 9,000 feet elevation and you don't have a tent. The night is pretty rough. And I knew that, like, I didn't sleep. So next morning, I, I knew I might not gonna make this here. This is so hard. So the next morning, like, the work is, like, worked so fast. It was, it, it was impossible for me to, to keep up the pace. So they were not hiking up the mountain, up to, like, 12,000 feet. They were running. And I knew this was a mistake that I ever joined. I'm done. I'm done. The 20 kilograms. They. They basically are too much. No, I'm losing touch to the porters. Senor, una pregunta. Sorry, but I just can't go on. I can strap the bags on the horses. Disculpa. Sorry, that's not possible. The horses are fully loaded. No way. <laughs> Port is getting angry. They're always shouting from up there that I should definitely hurry up and not take a break because they have to be on top of the mountain before the tourists arrive because the tourists want food. Want food. So if they don't get food on time, they might want their money back. And it's my fault right now. So. I'm over 4,000 meters and there is no air. I can't breathe. I wish I wouldn't have never done this. <sighs> Let's say things didn't work out that well. Huh? So I knew I made a mistake, you know? I, I just thought, okay, now I'm, I'm constantly in this change process, things work out, but here, here was a limit reached. And so the porters said, look, thank you very much, but feel free to go back. You know, we, we need to do this by ourselves. So. I went back and I, I think I learned a couple things. Well, failure again, it's part of every challenge. Why not? It didn't work out, fair enough, I went back. But then I, 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 re, I reflected on the situation afterwards, after the entire trip, and I reflected on resilience. And it's something so important to, to think about in terms of like change, but also stress management. You know, we all experience stress at one stage and people who are very re resilient have a much easier time to go through like a stressful period than people who have a low level of resilience. And I must admit, nowadays my resilience is way better than it was at, on, on the trip. So because I worked on it, there are like seven pillars of resilience. If you, if you, if you break down resilience, it's, it contains seven different pillars, optimism, acceptance, solution orientation, personal control, self-responsibility, networking, and goal setting, future shaping. And I'm sure all of you here are probably good in many of them, but it's worth to just look at it. Is any of, of, of these pillars not that strong in my life? You know, you could, for example, scale it from zero to 10. 10 is like the greatest. Yeah, I'm a very optimistic person. Or maybe five, 
I tend to be optimistic, but sometimes I'm not. If you, if you feel like there are some pillars, which are maybe just like a four or five or a six, something like that, it's great to work on it. Because if, if we manage to be pretty high on all seven pillars, we are strong in terms of change and also stress management. And this is something when I give seminars, on, for example, on, on resilience nowadays, this is what we work on. And, and people came back to me a year later and they said, look, I became a much more optimistic person and I accept out, outside circumstances way better than I did before. And that helps in being resilient. So back to the trip. I went back and there was a friend of mine working in Peru for a year. European guy and he was, he was working there as an expert. And he said, look, don't worry that you know, your whole porter job didn't work out, just rest in my apartment for a couple of days, all good. So now, unfortunately, something very unfortunate happened, very unfortunate, something that should never happen in one's lifetime. It happened to me once and not again, luckily. The house went on fire. It's, it's not a joke. So all of a sudden, there was a fire in the apartment and the entire apartment went on fire. So him and me, we were safe. We could leave the apartment. We could take our bags. You know, everybody's safe. But it was such a stressful situation. You know, the, 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 the fire department came in, they, 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 they got a grip on the whole fire. And basically, I, I had to sleep outside that night. And imagine, you're, you're somewhere in the world without money, and you go through like stressful situations, like the one before and this one. It's pretty hard. And I felt at this stage, well, actually, I want to go back home. That I, I don't feel like this is so much fun anymore. At the beginning, it was so much fun being the human sofa. Now it's like dealing with fires and being somewhere in a, in a country without money. It felt really stressful. And I almost gave up. I almost gave up. I had a phone on me, like a rescue phone, to just call people at home to kind of book a flight and go back. And I'm glad I haven't given up. And you know why I haven't given up? Because of one of these pillars on resilience, the networking part. I think I'm kind of okay with, with networking and I met a lot of people in town at this stage. And these people came back to me and they told me, look, you're in a crisis, you wanna go back, but you know what, you will not go back. You know, we're gonna do a, 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 a trade with you, a barter deal, you know, you're gonna be our uh, tourist guide and we're gonna help you with food, accommodation and travel, but you do not give up. And this is so good. In, in, in times of crisis, to have the right people around you, the right network, colleagues, friends, family, to really support you and say, look, by yourself, you would kind of give up right now, but no, we are in a team, you do not give up. And these people, these two people made it happen that I didn't give up. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here today. It, just imagine, I, if I would have given up, I wouldn't be here on stage. Huh? So, Lucky. So networking is such an important part uh, um, for, for everything, for change management and, and to, to leave a crisis. So here, I was there, tourist guide, helped them, you know. I was like kind of maneuvering that paddle boat and this was the last lesson I learned. So they gave me money and food and I could travel to the neighboring country, Chile, and I thought about self-management and time management as a lesson I learned on this trip. I mean, we all know like to be organized at work, to be structured, not to procrastinate, hopefully, you know, to work in time blocks, to prioritize, to avoid time wasters. And I looked at this trip and at the beginning, I was way less self-organized than at the end. It helped me so much. For example, time wasters. Like on that trip, many people approached me and said, oh, this is so interesting what you do. Can you, can you please share your story about this trip? And at the beginning, I was so excited. I was telling everyone my story and I just didn't have time to, to barter for food, travel, accommodation because I was just doing so many other things and didn't focus on that actual goal to get food, accommodation and travel for free. Later on on the trip, I kind of like, let people know, but I said, look, sorry, I really need to move on right now because I just need an accommodation for tonight. I cannot just like, you know, chat away for two hours here. I, I need to focus on my goal, you know, and prioritize what is, the what is the most important and the most urgent at this time. Also in office, what is my most important and most urgent thing to do? And what are the least important and least urgent things to do? To prioritize work, you know, and to 
avoid procrastination. I've, I remember I used to procrastinate so much, like, yeah, I'm going to do it tomorrow, two, three days, and uh, I don't like that work, I do it later. This trip taught me, if I don't do it right now, important things, I'm going to have a, a serious issue. I was forced to not procrastinate, and it was such a great exercise to, to, to do things, important things, right now. Otherwise, the whole trip wouldn't have worked out. So this is something always to look at, how, how well am I self and time uh, organized, and could I maybe uh, improve any of these points? So my trip came to the end. I traveled from Chile to Argentina, and then down to the most southernmost city in the world. It's the southern tip of South America, and it's called Ushuaia. So Ushuaia is a port for vessels, for, for luxury cruise ships to go from there to Antarctica. And it's pretty pricey. You want, you want to book a trip to Antarctica, it's awesome, but it costs like $10,000. So I didn't have the $10,000. So I, I had contacted before the trip all these vessels, all these cruise companies, offering my labor, and one of them said, okay, good. If you're going to make it here until November, well, you're going to be the assistant of the expedition leader, and you're going to get the trip for free. So this was kind of pre-planned, but when I made it here to the city of Ushuaia, I knew I'm going to go on that ship, I worked there, and I'm going to make it to Antarctica. And that was the end of my story. Germany to Antarctica for free. And after a couple of days across ice and across really interesting scenery, we made it to Antarctica. I reached Antarctica. Yes! Wiggy is overjoyed to have finally reached his eagerly anticipated goal. 150 days of extreme highs and lows. Often, he has thought that Antarctica would remain just a dream after the most intensive months of his life. I've reached Antarctica. Yes, I finally made it. I can't believe it. It happened. A few facts of this trip. I crossed 11 countries. I had 40 different places to sleep. I asked more than 500 times for food in shops and restaurants. I traveled 35,000 Ks within 150 days, and over 100 people, very nice and generous people, helped me on this trip, and I'm really happy to have had the great chance to have me met these very, very, very nice people. It's cold, why did I travel here? I can't believe it. Yeah, pretty cold place, believe me. So if you go there, you know, take some warm jacket, it's pretty cold. And I was happy that I, that I reached my goal, that I, that I made it, these 25,000 miles without money. And I reflected back on this trip later on, like even a couple of years later, and I looked at these seven lessons over and over. And this was what helped me so much in my later life. Like whenever there is fear, challenge, confront the fear. Yeah, don't go around, we all want to go around, but hey, tomorrow morning I'm going to get up and I want, to, I want to face an obstacle, I want to confront it. And it's so good to do it, to develop and also to embrace change, to revise my beliefs. What kind of beliefs might hold me back? Often a negative belief is something like, I shouldn't, I couldn't, I mustn't. Yeah, sometimes we learn that along the way in our lives and to just like, Find some, spot one, and just like revise it. It can be so helpful to go further, to be stronger. You know, fail forward, something that helped me so much in life. It happens, we're winning, we are losing. This is our life, and failing, it means like failing forward for me nowadays. Change can, can be uh, sabotaged by certain things. To always look at it, you know, what is maybe the belief that it's just temporary, that, that could kind of hold me back from a successful change management. Seven emotional stages of change. First, the shock. I don't like the online tool. Oh, it's so dangerous. And then at the end, after seven stages, well, I was the one who, who wanted it anyway. And then seven pillars of resilience and to work on self and time management. And I'm sure in your work life and the associations, you, you know all of these. You're dealing with all of these on a daily basis. And it's always good to refresh 
these things, to, to look at it, well, it's right, you know, maybe I want to leave my comfort zone more because we want to push this to another level. We want to move this on or motivate your team like with, with certain elements of these seven bulletin points. So it might sound like, okay, this is the end of the trip, the guy is done, right? No, it's not. It's just the beginning. So don't worry, I won't talk for another hour, but this was just the beginning. I just went, to, I went back to Germany after this uh, trip and I published a book, yeah, the German version of how to travel the world for free, published it, became a success luckily, yeah, like number one on Amazon travel charts for a couple of weeks and the videos I shot, I, I edited to an entire show, five part, half an hour show, broadcasted, it was broadcasted on national television in Germany. So it was a great success. I worked hard on making this happen. But here is here's the interesting thing. This trip like, put me into a different mindset. The, 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 the constantly embracing change. This was, this was my mindset. It was nothing like feeling like kind of awkward anymore. So after the trip, without reflecting on it, I just moved on. You know, after publishing the German book, the, the German TV show, I went on. Let's just translate the book into English, kind of try to uh, make it in America, edit the English version of my video material. I recorded bilingual. So what happened was pretty interesting. So I published, self-published this, this, this book here in America on Amazon. And, uh, um, well, no one really sees it, first of all, but I got a, a person helping me to put it out there. And then the video material, like PBS, national PBS uh, station, they said, look, we, we, we are interested in broadcasting this, but what we're doing it the same way than you do, we do it for free. How, how cool is that? I was like, okay, <laughs> that's pretty awesome. Well, I, in the end of the day, it's fair enough. So they broadcasted it for free, and then, the things were broadcasting, I think, nationwide on PBS. And luckily, you all know Jay Leno, who, who was um, hosting The Tonight Show uh, until like end of 2012. He must have seen it one night. And he just like kind of looked at it. He's like, why not getting that guy without money in our show? And uh, so I was really lucky. They, they called me one day. I flew to Los Angeles at that time. And I was the guest on The Tonight Show, together with Katy Perry, actually. Huh? So, Great, great night. It was a great, awesome night. If you want to see that video, and you can just, just YouTube uh, uh, Tonight Show Michael Wiggy. So the next morning, I appeared on the Today Show. Then there were the reporters of LA Times, USA Today. So the whole thing became big. And I could apply for residency in America and start my business here. Nowadays, I live close to Denver in Colorado. Happy person. So why am I mentioning this? Because my goal was just to travel the world for free. But afterwards, so much happened because I had changed my mindset. I, yeah, I call it the challenge for change mindset. A, a mindset that is not going around fear, just confronting it every time and doing this on purpose and wanting to do this. And this helped me so much. And that all these beautiful things happened afterwards. And if you forward yeah, like, like a change process in your association to your staff, hey, this is the message. The result will be way bigger then, then we can see right now. We have a certain goal we want to reach, but if everyone joins the process you know, and overcomes the fear and leaves the comfort zone, the goal will be way beyond of what we are kind of planning right now. And I can say that because everything that happened here was way, way, way bigger than I ever expected, and I'm glad I had this experience. So always keep on trying and never give up. It's absolutely worth it. And Thank you very much for listening. So at, in half an hour, I'm going to have an, a breakout session downstairs with another trip, trade up around the world. That was two years later, trying to barter an apple for bigger and better to get a house in Hawaii. So the bigger and better game. So I learned, I think I learned a little bit about our ch sales. I was a really bad salesman at that time. So I had to learn sales, 11.30 downstairs. And uh, if you're interested in any of my books, over there later on, and I would be happy if we could exchange contact details. I got an email list later on, or if you just want to feel like sharing your, your business card with me, that would be great. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much for the invitation, and I wish you a great two-day conference today here in South Bend. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you.